so okay so let's just uh, go for it huh? hi everybody i'm ziv and welcome to another video of voices from china and today i'm here in songshang lake at this uh, beautiful big massive school of international education uh, called tin lan shan and this is also known as the huawei school which is very interesting and that's something i want to talk today with lawrence curtis that is uh, the prin not the principal. How do you call it? Uh, division director. Division so director of primary. Correct. Yes. Primary school, and you're from England. Yes, that is correct. All right. So we'll see you right after the break. Okay, let's start. So. Um, Lawrence, you've been here since day one, I've heard. Yes, uh, joined the school, uh, it would be in August 2017. August 2017, about four years ago. Correct. And how did you find this job? Uh, just online, uh, LinkedIn ironically. Uh, a recruiter sort of uh, picked up my profile um, and I was, I was working back home in England at the time and having previously been in China once and then went home working in Shanghai, I knew that I wanted to come back and sort of uh, Finish what I had planned to do, which would be sort of influential in sort of physical education in China, and um, I went through the application process. And uh, four years, I'm still here. Oh, that's cool. All right. I was just saying in the intro, it's School of International Education, mm -hmm. right? What does that mean? Because you have uh, in China international schools, foreign language schools, bilingual schools, ex experimental schools, public schools. I've never heard of uh, schools of international education. How do you explain it? Yeah, I think uh, it's a concept that uh, comes from the fact that uh, a lot of these students may have already lived overseas. Uh, they're students who are Chinese national or local passport holders. And they want to sort of uh, be embedded into this sort of international mindedness, uh, this school that teaches an international curriculum, whilst also focuses on uh, where students come from. Uh, one of our sort of main missions of the school is that, you know, remember where you come from. You know, your heritage and uh, motherland is vital to these students. But we do also cater for the international students. Uh, we enroll students from overseas. We enroll students with foreign passport holders. But due to sort of regulations within China, uh, where do we sit on that sort of uh, public school? We want to sort of move away from that. Uh, are we an uh, experimental school or bilingual school? Uh, we like to see ourselves more on a, a system towards international education, but we don't meet the requirements to be an international school. So I think the best way to describe our school would be a school of international education, and that's what we cater for. Right. This is very unique. Uh, I've never seen a school like this, in, definitely not uh, in, in South China where we are now. Um, this is the Huawei school. Everybody call it the Huawei school. Um, and why is that? I mean, Huawei, big, uh, massive campus is about 10 minutes from here, right? Yes. Huawei is basically the owner of this school? Yes, so we have two stakeholders. Uh, one stakeholder would be Huawei, uh, and the other is uh, Tsinghua. Um, Tsinghua so University, very famous, from yes. Beijing. Right. Uh, so if you sort of uh, divide that two sort of different strands, uh, you'd perhaps have the education side, which would be Tsinghua, uh, who foster a lot of the teachers that came down here. They've graduated from Tsinghua. Uh, it's very well known. And on the other side, we have uh, Huawei, who I think were sort of the uh, inventors of this school. They came up with the idea, the concept, which was to support the fact that they are relocating all their stuff. Uh, so the wonderful campus, the European town, uh, which is well worth a visit, uh, is about 10 minutes away from here. They are the offices for the uh, employees. A lot of these employees have been overseas, um, and a lot of the children were uh, sort of enrolled into schools that were international schools. Uh, they've been in sort of Africa, they've been in South America, they've been in Europe. So the children are very much used to this idea and concept of international education. English is a first language, mm -hmm. whilst they still have the cultural values of being Chinese. So we say that they're sort of third, third culture children. Right. When they come here, uh, the parents may or may not want to enroll them into a public system. They have the choice. Uh, maybe the student's uh, Chinese level uh, is not quite enough to be able to enter into the system straight away um, due to having missed a lot of the elementary or primary school of right. Chinese education. So therefore, quite away came with this wonderful idea uh, that sort of put all these building blocks together and, and put together Qinglan School, you know, our school yeah. of international education. Huawei, Huawei uh, has opened the campus in Dongguan, the European city or village <coughs> yes. a few years ago, right? Mm. Um, and so about 50,000 people are going to work there. So they figured all these uh, Huawei employees coming back from uh, being posted abroad and they need a school, right? So that's the thing. How many, uh, what's the percent of kids here that are uh, kids of 
Huawei employees? Uh, I don't know the exact number. I would right. certainly estimate around 40%, uh, maybe slightly more. Uh, and it is continuously increasing. You know, as Huawei develops and sort of uh, brings more of their employees back, uh, we need to have the seats for those and the capacity for those employees to have their child positioned in our school. Right. Uh, I mean, this is also, uh, I think, known as the most expensive school in this city, in Dongguan. And honestly, I was doubting, but like walking inside um, and outside, I can see at least where the money <laughs> is going. You know, some schools you don't you don't see that, right? Um, so, so your clientele, um, not just Huawei kids, right? Who, how do you define them? Yeah, I think uh, when you look at sort of the, the clientele of the school, number one would be would be Huawei. You know, that, that's the main purpose of the school. Right. Uh, however, we do enroll a lot of students that are, as I said, local passport holders, and they are Chinese. But parents uh, envision their child perhaps going overseas, perhaps been educated in a different system they, they went through. Uh, you know, the education system in China, uh, although it's whenever you know a reform, uh, you know, a few years back. Uh, it's, it's a like or a dislike you know, to some parents and I think that some of the parents here who have to come under that category of being you know wealthy you know, they, they have right. to high wealthy um, parents because they have to be able to afford the tuition and it's not yes. just for one year the most important thing is retention yes. we don't want to lose students in the last few years we've gone from 175 to 800 students so therefore there is a market for it and they're the sort of people we're trying to sort of enroll so those local students, uh, sort of families within the Dongguan area and sort of further afield, uh, want to have this immersion program. They value the Chinese program, but they may not want their child to sit through these you know, tough and stressful exams right. that they go through. So they sort of have this journey that you know, in, in 10 years time, 15 years time, when they go through the whole education process, they want the opportunity to go, to go overseas. They may not fulfill that and pursue that completely, but they have that opportunity to be sort of uh, internationalized, you know, international mindedness. And here we do that very well. We have that balance between uh, the Chinese elements of things um, and certainly the international side. Is it recess now? It's lunchtime, sorry. It's that's lunchtime. why everyone's yeah. really hungry. Yeah, yeah that's why they're moving around. Food. <laughs> is the food good here? I mean, uh, yeah, it's uh, Sodexco, which is uh, an international branded um, company. I'll invite you for lunch uh, if they, you want. They, sure, I will. Uh, yeah, but they, they got both. They got Chinese and, uh, and Western food. Of course, uh, you know, help yourself, uh, style sort of food. I uh, have things like pizza, slightly unhealthy, maybe the kids right. love it. Right. Uh, noodles, uh, the Chinese style, the chef's choice, uh, the Western right. cuisine. Right. Um, so yeah, it's all here, breakfast, lunch and dinner. So. So to summarize, this is a, uh, uh, I try to say it in simple terms, this is a Chinese school, but, uh, but runs like an international school plus a Chinese school, all in one, trying to combine the, uh, both worlds in a way, right? Yeah, I, I think so, because uh, you know, from a personal side of things as well, I want to say that I work in an international school. You know, I, I want to be able to teach and sort of impart my knowledge and experience onto the students. Right. Uh, perhaps if you was in a, a governed by more of a Chinese school where there was more control and constraints of what you could do, you'd have to follow more of a rigorous curriculum and there's only certain things you can touch upon. Whereas right. here we look at the word hybrid, you know, it's very much uh, integrated so that we're able to be influential. I think that's really important and these students want to have that. The, the parents right. want to be taught, taught by, uh, you know, uh, an international teacher. They want right. to have that uh, cultural side, the language side. Um, and because they are sort of the passport holders, why should that restrict them? You know, just because you have a passport shouldn't restrict the education you wish, to, the journey you wish to take for your children. Right. Uh, and I think that's why these type of schools uh, are, are going to sort of creep up more and more. Uh, with recent pandemic, we may see a decline of international schools in the future. We Maybe, don't know what's yeah, going to happen. Because of uh, foreign uh, passport holders, uh, there are of, fewer and fewer. Of course, uh, and, and people are relocating or moving. But this sort of school is, is certainly something that is going to be around. Right. Uh, it's got the backing and the foundations, you know, look, look around us to certainly stay here for a long time. Right. Right. And you know our retention of staff, employment of staff is growing. The numbers and intake of students, so everything seems very positive at the moment. So you think Huawei will maybe go into education further and further? Will they open more schools? Can you see that happening? Uh, I, I, I think so. If you say we're sort of a, a test run or a trial run, <laughs> and if something is successful, then why not? Right, diversify. Um, yeah, there's there's lots of sort of uh, elements and sort of uh, paths that they could take here. Uh, you know, right. education is changing, or it should be changing. Right. You know, we're just talking about sort of 21st century skills, the teaching of knowledge, uh, looking at technology, integration of technology into classrooms. Um, you know, AL, all the, all this stuff that's sort of going on around us. 
you know, to be able to say that we're supported by you know, a technological giant right. you know, here in China is something that I'm certainly proud of and I want to be you know, immersed in this education change because it's going to have to happen. You know, right. When you look at classrooms back you know, pre-1900s, what they looked like, and today, there's only so many differences right. that you may see, right. but it's got to change. Everything else is changing. Do you have teachers from all over the world? All over the world. All, all over the world. Um, uh, teachers from uh, you know, European countries, uh, perhaps Serbia, France, uh, Spain, um, teachers from America, you know, of course, Canada. Right. Um, so no teacher... problem with Canada? No, no problem with Canada. <laughs> yeah, you'll be all right if you want a job. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, it looks like a great place to be a teacher. Uh, are you planning to stay for a long time? Uh, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> if everything goes well, um, you know, when you look around, why would we want to leave? Uh, really, it's uh, would I leave to another uh, school in China? Perhaps not. You know, this has this yeah. become very much about what my own philosophy of education is, you know, opportunity. I think that's the word that strives when you talk about education is about opportunity, be it for everyone. You know, if you want to be a sports person, we have sports academies. Uh, if you want to be an artist, we have art academies. Yeah. If you, uh, you know, strive for educational success and academics, we can, we can do that as well. Right. So we can cater for the needs of the students uh, and, and having a flexible approach is vital. You know, you have to do that uh, in, in sort of the school that we're in. All right, well, uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, thank you for the tour, it's really beautiful. And I hope that some uh, of our viewers now know more about the Huawei school, Qin Lan Shan. And until next time, if you like this video, please give it a like, a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. And again, thank you, Lawrence. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.